G'day legends, you may have noticed there is a new computer in the studio now. So I've upgraded my Intel Mac to a Mac Studio. And the reason being is it really feels like Apple is leaving Intel machines behind. And with every update, it becomes more apparent that having an M chip processor within your Mac is becoming really important to keeping up to date with everything. For example, in Logic, there's a whole bunch of new features that you cannot access unless you have an M chip Mac. Things like the new Chroma Glow plugin, as well as all of the different settings within the mastering plugin in Logic, which you cannot access unless you have an M chip processor in your Mac. So I'm coming from a 2019 Intel Mac and it had some pretty nice specs, um, 64 gig of RAM, eight core processor, whatever, I'll put the specs on the screen so you can see them. But the thing is, it ran well. And for a long time, it did run well until I started updating and then things started to get sluggish and really towards the end, started to become a nuisance working on that computer. So ever since I updated that computer from Catalina to Ventura, there has been some pretty significant performance issues, which have been kind of slowing me down and it's really making mundane tasks a little bit annoying. For example, like in Logic, you can select all of your audio files, go to the inspector and add a fade to all of those audio files at once. And it's generally instant. Ever since I took that Intel from Catalina to Ventura, whenever I do a simple task like that, the computer sits and thinks for 10 to 20 seconds about what it's doing, which really is annoying. It really holds me back because I want to be quick. I want to be working fast. And those kind of things, they add up over time and it really makes a task take a lot longer than it should. Now I could take that Intel and I could wipe it and do a clean install and sure, it probably might run a little bit better, but I think the fact is that Apple keeps rolling out updates and new operating systems, Intel machines are gonna be left behind. So I did a whole bunch of research, watched a bunch of videos on YouTube, looking at all the different like benchmark tests and all those different things and performance. So I'm not gonna really be showcasing a lot of that in this video, if you're interested in that, there's plenty of good videos out there that kind of compare M2 Max and M2 Ultra and all those things. And they're definitely worth checking out to help you make an informed decision. Now, one of the tough things about this is Macs are super expensive at the moment. Like they just keep going up in price. Have a look at like Mac Pros or whatever they are. They start from 12,000 Australian dollars, which is like nuts. So let me show you the specs that I've chosen for my studio. After watching a bunch of videos comparing the M2 Max and the M2 Ultra, I decided to go with the Max for the studio. Obviously the Ultra would be quite nice, but I really don't think I personally need that processing power at the moment. I'm not really doing like huge scored material for like cinema or like, you know, video games or anything like that. We need to be running a huge amount of sound libraries as well as having an extensive amount of tracks open all at the one time. So I think if you're going to do that kind of thing, the Ultra's probably the better choice. I still think the Max could probably handle that but these are the settings I've gone with. So like I said, I chose to go with the M2 Max, but I chose to upgrade to the 12 core CPU and the 38 core GPU with the 16 core neural engine. Having those couple extra cores just gives us a little bit extra processing power. So I went with the 64 gigabytes of RAM. Obviously it'd be nice to go higher, but it's just so ridiculously expensive with what Apple charge and you can only go up to 96 with the M2 Max and then you gotta jump into the Ultra, which once you start doing that, it becomes like a $10,000 computer. So the reason I chose the 64 gigabyte of RAM is that I do videos as well. So it makes video processing a lot smoother and easier. And I have noticed a big difference when I export videos, they export way faster than what they did on the Intel, which is awesome. It just means that the computer's not locked up for a certain amount of time doing exports happens a lot quicker and then I can move on to my next task. Whether you need 64 gigabytes for music production, I'm not so sure. If you're doing kind of general stuff, 32 gigabytes would be fine. If you're kind of doing bigger sessions, having 64 gigabytes is not gonna hurt. So I think that's kind of like a safe middle ground to go with. It sort of seems like kind of future-proofing yourself a little bit as well. And you know, if you're doing bigger projects and you're maybe working in like 4K footage and higher, you probably wanna go with as much RAM as you can get. Now storage, I went with two terabytes. My last few machines have been two terabytes and I'm always still running out of space. I have a couple of backups, I got Dropbox, everything. It's just takes up a lot of space. Audio just fills out your computer very quickly and it's always best to have as much space as possible. Again, would have liked to have gone four terabytes, but you know, it's just a lot of money. So two terabytes is working fine for me. And especially since I've done a clean install, I've just loaded everything back in and I don't have any junk on the computer at the moment. And I'm really gonna be disciplined and keep it that way. Just make sure anything I'm not using, get rid of it. Once I finish a project, move it off onto an external, 
all that kind of stuff. And I think two terabytes will be fine. So with those choices, we come to $5,100 Australian. So as it is a lot of money for a computer and especially considering you don't get a monitor. And I chose to get the Apple Studio Display, the most expensive monitor you can probably buy, which is ridiculous. But coming from working on a 5K Retina, it was really hard to find a monitor that wouldn't be a compromise from what I'm so used to already. So it's just one of those like whatever moments. Like it's a good looking monitor. I looked at a whole bunch of stuff in stores and it just doesn't look as good. You might look at monitors that have better specs, but the Apple Studio Display still just looks the best. Really crisp text, nice and bright. It's great. The price sucks though. I would have upgraded my computer a lot sooner, but the monitor really held me back because I, I think it was like two and a half grand for the Apple Display in Australia, which is again, a lot of money. And I probably could have got a half decent 4K monitor between $400 to $1,500 or even like an OLED kind of monitor. So after extensive research, just reading heaps of forums, watching heaps of YouTube videos, even like guys who are posting stuff saying, this is the best 4K monitor for Mac. And then six months later, they're like, hey, I was wrong. The Apple Studio Display is the best monitor I've ever owned. And all of the comments in forums are like that. They just say, just get the Apple Studio Display monitor. Or, you know, I bought this LG 4K monitor and then you know, four months later, I bought this studio display and it just kills it. So it's an annoying price to pay, but it just looks great. Am I an Apple fanboy? No, like I, I get angry at the fact that I had to pay $2,500 for this monitor, but it does look great. And I would hate to be looking at a monitor that doesn't have as crisp text or it has scaling issues that are eating up CPU. I know there's plenty of people who say it doesn't take up that much processing power, but either way, unless it's a 5K monitor, it's not native to the Apple ecosystem and you do have to scale it and maybe that's gonna create some small performance issue. Maybe it won't notice it at all. But either way, that's why I ran with this. So I've been using the Mac Studio for about a week and it's been great. It's been running really well. I haven't had any overloads in any sessions. Not that I would get heaps of overloads on the Intel, but occasionally once the session started to get really full of plugins, every now and then it, you get a pesky overload. But there is one session that I had which had over 200 tracks and it was like a six track EP and it's just a bunch of stuff and it was just this big tracking session, bunch of plugins in it. And when I came back to that session and tried to open it, I could not play it. Every time I hit play, it would overload. So somehow magically we managed to do all this tracking and it worked really fine. And then as soon as I came back to the session later, I just couldn't work in it unless I turned all the plugins off and then what's the point? Like I need that stuff on there. But that just shows the performance of the Intel, it couldn't open that. But now on this Mac, we'll take a look at this because I can open that session and it runs perfectly fine. Okay, so here's the session and Jack, if you're watching, this is your EP. You know, it's a big session. We've got like 200 plus tracks in here, drums, guitars, plenty of vocals, Melodyne, bunch of plugins, heaps of instances of Valhalla and gain reduction. I don't know if these use a lot of CPU or whatever, but you know, there's a bunch of stuff in it. There's enough plugins to cause problems if you don't have a powerful enough machine. And then we also have Pro L2 on here and I put it into oversampling 32 times. Now that is generally pretty CPU hungry and there's no chance that I could have had this running on the Intel Mac, which is just sitting over here, by the way. There's no chance I could have had any oversampling on Pro L2 and press play and it would have played. It would have just instantly popped and said overload. And so we are screen recording this at the same time which is also taking up valuable CPU of the computer. That definitely uses a fair chunk of CPU when you're screen recording. Definitely makes things more susceptible to overloading. Now let's just see if this plays back. It's playing completely fine. We can just jump around. By the way, this is a sick project. So this has basically been my benchmark test, being able to open this session and play it and put the limiter on 32 times oversampling and it plays perfectly and smoothly. Then that just shows me that this is a very powerful unit and I'm very happy with the choice I've made because my projects don't really get bigger than this. So I know I'm not gonna have any issues with performance and having any kind of overloads within Logic. Now we've got up to 310 channels in here, CPU hungry plugins, and it's running fine. And screen recording at the same time. Coming from the Intel, 
This is definitely a powerful unit. Now I did download a benchmark test for Logic off of a YouTube video that I watched. It's basically just a bunch of instances of sculpture. And then you basically just got a channel EQ, multipressor, some chorus, auto filter, and then there's also a reverb on there. And then the idea is you just find out how many instances of this that you can play at once before it overloads. So on the video that I watched, they said that they got it up to about 200 channels for the M2 Max. And that's when they have the output and the input set to the max input and the max output not running through an interface. It's just directly through the Mac Studio. So I currently have this set to my aggregate device, which is basically the Focusrite Clarette and then a virtual interface called Black Hole, which allows me to capture the audio from my Mac in stereo while screen capturing. So at the moment we're getting 178 channels of sculpture with all of those plugins I mentioned, which is pretty powerful. When I tried this on the Intel Mac, I think I got to about 54 channels before it stopped working. So roughly that's a three times improvement. And this test doesn't really translate that much to like real world use anyway, but basically it just shows you how much more processing power the computer has. Now, as far as plugins go, pretty much everything has worked that I've carried over from my Intel. There were some plugins that wouldn't initially load and that's basically because Logic needed to be run in Rosetta to allow those Intel plugins to continue working, which I have been doing and I haven't really noticed any kind of performance issues while being in Rosetta. If you've heard a lot about Rosetta and you haven't used it like myself until this week, basically to access Rosetta, you just come to applications, right click on Logic Pro, get info and then under here you can click on open using Rosetta. This basically allows it to access Intel plugins and let them run on your end chip Mac. So for example some of my Isotope plugins are kind of old now. I've got RX7 and Ozone 9 and those weren't recognized by Logic anymore but as soon as I put it into Rosetta they appeared and they were working fine again. A bunch of my Waves plugins didn't show up. Uh, I'm running a subscription at the moment with Waves, so I'm not sure if since I've moved to Rosetta if they do work or not because I'm just using the everything subscription through Waves. But I did see something in a forum that it was like something like anything past V14 works on silicon chip max. Whereas anything beforehand, pretty much you gotta pay for the Waves update plan or something like that, which you know, can be a bit of a pain. So for the most part, setting it up has been fine. It took about a week. I had to sit there downloading everything. The internet here is pretty rubbish. So downloads take a little while and there's probably like 700 gigs of stuff that I downloaded this week. Just the libraries and all the plugins and everything like that. I have a lot of third party plugins. It just takes a lot of time when you have bad internet, but I prefer to do it that way rather than doing the migration because I can leave behind all the junk that has accrued over the years on that Mac just get a nice squeaky clean start and try and keep it that way. So I guess the point of this video is that if you're thinking of jumping into like a Mac Studio, I know there's probably some new Mac Studios that are coming out soon, but like I just can't be bothered waiting for that. And pretty much every time I buy a Mac, like the next thing comes out next month. So like just get the computer that you need now. You're always gonna need to upgrade later again anyway. So it doesn't really matter. If you are thinking of getting a Mac Studio, I can vouch for the M2 Max. I think it's a solid machine. It works really well. If you're not doing crazy video editing, which I think is probably where like the Ultra would be better. Like if you're starting to do stuff in like 8K or whatever, like that's where you're gonna get the most performance out of it is in video editing, maybe like 3D rendering and stuff like that. Whereas audio production, I think the M2 Max holds itself really well, especially if you're just doing like band material, you're not doing any crazy epic scoring. And even then, I still think this would probably run fine. But I just wanna say I can vouch for it. I think it's a solid machine. Obviously it's an expensive upgrade, but if you do this for a living like myself, then sometimes you just gotta bite the bullet and pay the Apple tax. I know the Windows warriors are gonna come out down below and say, you should've bought a PC. But mate, once you go Mac, you don't go back. So I'm stoked with this, it's working great. My Claret interface is still talking to the Mac Studio. I just had to download some new drivers and use uh, the same Thunderbolt adapter that I had on the back of my other Mac and everything's working fine. I wanna shut this down and then boot it back up. It starts in a couple of seconds and you're back here again. Whereas on the Intel Mac, when I had to shut it down and restart it, it'd always take a decent amount of time to get back up and going and then all of the startup stuff would still just kind of linger for a while before the computer started responding to the max that it could. Whereas this one's just like, 
couple seconds and you're in and you're running. I've definitely noticed when I load stuff like DaVinci Resolve, which is the program I use for video editing, it loads really fast. Whereas on the Intel, again, it would just sort of take a little while for it to load up and get going. Everything on this is like really snappy. So there you go, that's my new studio computer right there. Pretty happy with it so far and I think it's gonna serve me well for the next couple of years to come. Hopefully this video has been helpful if you've been considering upgrading from an Intel to a silicon based Mac. Maybe watching this has helped you come to a decision. It took me a little while to, to make the jump. I wish I did it a little bit sooner personally, but they are expensive, but it is also an investment if it's something that you're serious about, if you're working on production all the time, if you do this as a living, it's just one of those things you gotta upgrade your gear from time to time. And this was the right time for me to make the jump. And maybe you're about to make the jump soon. And if you are, I definitely think it's worth it. I've noticed a massive improvement. Things run so much quicker and better on the Silicon Macs as opposed to the Intels. It's definitely the way that they're heading. And if you don't go there soon, you probably will just start to notice big performance issues on your Mac if you're trying to keep up to date with everything. Just my two cents. But otherwise, if you're still on Catalina, just don't update, just stay back there. I kind of wish that I never updated my Intel. It definitely caused me some grief and f for no real reason up other than to update a few plugins that didn't really make a big difference to my workflow. So either stay in the past or come join us in the future. But otherwise, hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support this channel, check out the description link below. Grabbing a sample pack or a mixing course, anything like that is a massive support for the time that goes into making these kinds of videos. Be keen to stick around for another video and check this one out.